Well, hi, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about aortic dissection. This is like the tag team thing. It's like passing the baton, which I, it's the wrong Olympic year, year for that, but it's the right idea. Um, we're going to talk about aortic dissection. Um, one of the sort of the bugaboos for most of us that practice in the emergency department because we all know that our push on chest pain patients is door to needle time. You know, we assume most chest pain patients have acute coronary syndrome. That's our biggest worry. We, you know, the push is to be timely and efficient, et cetera. The problem is if you happen to be very timely and efficient and that is not an acute coronary syndrome but is an aortic dissection, you now have a dead patient on your hands So, if you thrombolyse them. So we know this is an issue. We know this is a problem. And I think it's second only to PE in its frustration level as far as how to catch it, evaluate it, work it up, and then treating is actually pretty easy. What we're going to do is focus on a couple of specific questions that deal with aortic dissection. This, again, like you've kind of gotten in the flow of this week, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive sort of dis discussion of the topic, but more sort of the areas that are of some conundrum or some concern that come, that come up with aortic dissection. So that's the deal. The first question is, can aortic dissection present without pain? How many of you have seen an aortic dissection case in somebody who's been painless? I have. Anybody else seen one in a completely painless case? It's so unfair. This is one of my list of things if I make it to heaven, which is of some question, but if I make it to heaven, I have a long list of things to discuss with whoever's in charge up there, whatever your belief system happens to be, one of which is why in God's earth would you let aortic dissection be painless? It can be. Now, this particular, the first two abstracts here are just reports of cases. One is a report of a single case, another is a report of two, although later in the, as we go through some of the papers, there is a paper in there that has 33% of the cases in this small study that were painless on presentation. I'll tell you what happens though, is usually if somebody has a dissection that is painless, they present with something else of concern. And the usual thing they present with is a neurologic abnormality. And not infrequently, a neurologic abnormality that waxes and wanes. The point, sort of the take home point of this is, yes indeed it can occur, fortunately it's not that common. Um, it's actually probably less than 10% of cases, probably more like 5%. That one paper is a real outlier that has 33%. But, they, but if you see somebody who has a neurologic deficit, they're hemiplegic, they have you know, some odd weird, the last one I saw was a guy who came in paraplegic, painlessly paraplegic, out of nowhere, like that, painlessly paraplegic, because his dissection had hit his artery of Adamkowitz right at his L-spine level, and he came in unable to walk. No neurologic function from basically hips down. He was completely painless, but I had a neurologic thing, so what we did is checked pulses on both sides and found abnormal uh, pulse deficit. So it's kind of a general rule of thumb that's kind of nice style points for you know, medicine is if you have a chest pain patient who comes in, check for a good neurologic exam and check pulse deficits. And if you have a neurologic patient who comes in, check pulse deficits and see if there's a difference in pulses. Now we'll talk about how good that is as far as a good finding for dissection a little bit later. But overall, just it's sort of, it's more style points than anything, again, good in this era of the Olympics, um, but it's probably a, a worthwhile practice. Just understand that yes, indeed, this difficult already diagnosis can present painlessly. Now, the classic findings are what? You're taught in school, they lie to you in school. You all know that they lie to you like all the time in school. They tell you, aortic dissection presents as what? Acute pain radiates to your back, rips down the middle of your back. Oh, they lie like dogs. Kind of, sort of. The classic findings on aortic dissection are found in about 60 to 80 percent of patients, meaning that 30 to 50 percent ish will, have, will not have those classic findings of ripping, sharp chest pain. It would be nice if they did, but they don't. We'll talk a little bit later. There's some, some statistics that are a little more kind of um, encouraging. But these, what these next set of abstracts look at is, can we, if, if the classic stuff isn't there, are there ways we can get other pieces of data and information to increase the likelihood of the disease? What we really want to do is be able to go to a bedside and say, if they don't have this, they don't have this, they don't have this, the likelihood is low that they don't, you know, that they have aortic dissection, and I can just dispense with the concept. Or if they do have this, and they do have this, and they do have this, okay, now I'm really worried. That's what these next couple of papers look at. They try to find out what are the high yield clinical findings in somebody who has aortic dissection. Abstract number three was a, a 21 article review of 2,000 cases of possible aortic dissection. So the kind of people that we would go to the bedside, it's in my differential. They looked at all of those people's history findings, physical findings, clinic, you know, the whole sort of workup stuff, and tried to figure out what were the highest yield things you as the person at the bedside would get on history or physical to tell you, yes, indeed, it's a dissection. A couple of things were helpful. 
if they had blood pressure or pulse differentials from one side to the other, one arm to the other. That, in, that was a pretty good finding as far as likelihood ratio. Ten, the likelihood ratio, positive likelihood ratio is 10. They were 10 times more likely than somebody without those differences to have an aortic dissection. So that was helpful. What, else, what also was helpful was the quality. If they said the pain was tearing or ripping, if they offered that to you, God, it's just like ripping down my back. This pain is just awful. That was helpful. Okay, that, that also had a likelihood ratio that was pretty good, about 10. And then overall, neurologic deficits, if they had focal neurologic deficits that you could find, that really bumped the likelihood ratio. That increased it to about 33. What they try to do with this, and the next paper does the same thing, is tries to kind of group them. Okay, well, if they had one of those findings, just one, they just had the pulse differential, that was it, no chest pain, nothing else. Just, I, I went to one of you, and I checked your blood pressure in both arms, and it's, it's more than 10 different. Well, that didn't necessarily mean he's having a dissection. The, li the single finding alone was only a likelihood ratio of only about 0.5 or so. But you add more of those together. They had all three. They had the ripping pain, they had pulse differentials and neurologic findings. The likelihood ratio was 66. It's pretty much almost a slam dunk if they have all of those. So no single finding said, ta-da, we're there. But the more you had, the more likely they were to have dissection. The next paper does a similar thing. This is a smaller study. It took 250 patients in whom you suspected it, 128 of them, so about half, had the diagnosis when the final workup was done. And they did the same thing. I said, what, what are the things on history and physical helped me say that you'll differentiate the had it group from the didn't have it group? The had it group, if they had aortic pain, ripping, tearing, that kind of pain, their odds ratio was six. If they had x-ray abnormalities, which I'm going to come back to because this is a bit of a problem, that really bumped their odds ratio, ratio to 58, really sent it through the ceiling. And those pressure def deficits in the arms were the same as in the other study, about 10. And again, what they did in this one is tried to say, if we add them all together, I mean, I, none of us would not work up somebody who had ripping chest pain with a wide mediastinum on the chest x-ray and abnormal pulses in both, you know, comparatively. None of us would not work up that person. It's more, you know, is one helpful? I'll tell you what happened on this paper that I found, found very frustrating. They went through all these differentiators and they said, okay, if you have all three, you're the first and the last, you have this, that, but they said if you had none of those, if you had no ripping, tearing quality or pain, you had no abnormal chest x-ray DLE, or you had no pulse to pressure deficit, you still had a 7% risk. They still had 7% of the people with dissection. They didn't have any of those three findings. Well, they come in for very, you know, the, the problem is, they, they, well, actually, the last dissection patient I saw just wasn't feeling well today. It was an 80-year-old guy who came in saying, I don't know, I just don't feel well. What's wrong? I don't know. I just don't have any appetite. I just don't feel well today. And, the, and this is where God bless good nurses. Because the nurse came up to me and said, he doesn't have a blood pressure. I said, oh, come on, I was just talking to the guy. He has a blood pressure. She said, no, he doesn't. So I went to the bedside, and I'll be darned if in his left arm, he didn't have a blood pressure. But his right arm, he did. He was in the OR in about 20 minutes. It was one of those straight to CT, right to the OR, one of those, thank you, <laughs> whatever powers that be out there, thank you. This was no skill on my part. This was just a good nurse communicating with me and my believing her because she was fabulous. So it's, there, it's just a frustrating, I'll go into some more complaints later, what they come in with. Um, overall, though, just be careful with this diagnosis because people do not present classically usually, and it's just very frustrating. And if you really want to get frustrated, look up abstract number seven. What abstract number seven does is gives the litany an answer sort of your question of what will they come in with if they have an aortic dissection. In this particular paper, I won't go through all of them, but let me tell you, they come in with congestive heart failure, strokes, shock, paraplegia, lower extremity ischemic changes, hoarseness, hemoptysis, upper airway obstruction, superior vena cava syndrome, upper GI hemorrhage, DVT of the leg with or without abdominal pain. Thank you so much. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> These things, hoarseness, hoarseness. I mean, hoarseness is, you're supposed to think of aortic dissection with hoarseness. I think what are helpful are certain things, though, that might be clues to you. Hoarseness, I don't care. I do care, though, if I hear a new aortic insufficiency murmur. Have you ever had a murmur before? No. Nope. Well, now that's kind of interesting. You have a little chest pain and a murmur, that's interesting. Or you had a syncopal episode this morning. You just passed out cold? Yeah, weird. I just passed out. A young you know, woman of childbearing age, we think about a rupturedic topic. An older person who just boom goes down, we think cardiac and think about that aorta. Did they rupture AAA and now they're tamponaded or did they dissect? So throw it in your weirdo diagnosis, you know, things in your differential of syncope. Low yield, unlikely as far as the odds. However, it is how, with some of these weirder ways that people with dissection will, will present. Frustrating, I wish I could give you 
you know, this is a fabulous physical exam finding, this is a fabulous historic, you know, thing, and if you don't have any of those, you're off the hook. I can't tell you that, okay? I cannot tell you that. It's one of these frustrating diseases that you kind of just go with the gut, know where the pitfalls are, and then work them up appropriately. It's, and we'll talk about the workup in a sec. There is also um, one other sort of style point that Misha Good Doc has dealt with in abstract number eight, which is there is a predilection for, in certain families, and these aren't the Marfan families. These are just certain families have a predilection for dissection. I don't know if they have cystic medial necrosis or some other sort of collagen vascular issue in these families, but that's a report of a single case. But it turns out that about 5% of aortic dissection cases, non-Marfanoid, will have a family member who has also had an aortic dissection. And these are people who have no other reason to have it. So again, style points that make you kind of a hot doc. Chest pain, you're gonna check for pulse deficits and do a good neuro exam. Neuro cases, you're gonna check for, your, for pulse deficits. And you go to the bedside of somebody who's having chest pain or something that's concerning, you're gonna say, do you have a family history of sudden death or aortic dissection in your family? Not just, do you have a family history of heart disease? So specific answers back will help you. So that's just one little thing they mentioned in there. I can't tell you how to get there, but when you get to the point of imaging, what should you do? The next couple of abstracts look at the utility, you know, what, what imaging studies are useful. Abstracts number nine and 10 look at chest x-rays. Now these kinds of papers I find incredibly irritating. This, these two papers basically say that chest x-rays can be positive as much as 90% of the time. One of the papers actually says that it can be negative as much as 40% of the time. The problem is most of these are radiology papers, and what they do with these papers is they take, for instance, did you know that there are 10 chest x-ray findings that go with aortic dissection? 10. I don't know them. I, mean, I had to look them up. I had to look them up on this particular paper. There are 10. I look for the aortic you know, knob widening. I look for the widened mediastinum. I even look for that calcium outer wall separation thing, because that's kind of cool. But there are other things on here, like ectatic aorta of a certain size in a certain place that are considered positive findings for suggestion of dissection that radiologists may look at. It doesn't help me to know these things if it's not something either I look at or the radiologists in my hospital look at, and I'm not sure that they do. Do know that the things that are most helpful as far as positive findings are a widened knob and a widened mediastinum. So those are worth checking for. And if you're worried about dissection, think about it. You order how many chest x-rays in a shift? 10, 12, whatever. You order a lot. Your radiologist is looking at 5 billion chest x-rays a day. If dissection is something you're worried about, it's worth a communication. It's worth saying, you know, can you go back and double check that aorta? What do you think? If it's positive, if it's abnormal and you're entertaining the diagnosis of dissection, that's extraordinarily helpful to you. If it's not, you're entertaining the diagnosis of dissection and the chest x-ray is fine, you're not off the hook. Okay, so it helps you if it's positive, but it is gonna be negative in as high as 10 to 40%, depending on what study you read. And the other discouraging thing just to kind of throw in there to make it a little more frustrating is that radiologists don't necessarily agree with each other on the same chest x-ray whether there's an abnormality of the aortic knob. They usually agree on wide mediastinum. They're pretty good on that. They're decent on the knob and all those other funky things, ectatic aortas, blah, 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 they don't agree with each other enough to make it reliable. So the two things, again, positive, wide mediastinum, wide knob, cool. I'm still worried about the diagnosis and the chest x-ray is negative, I'm not done. I'm not finished. It's not a good enough study as a negative study to rule out the diagnosis. So that's kind of key as a take home. How about a CT angio? You guys doing CT angios for your aortic dissections? Anybody doing anything other than CT angio and working them up? PE. It, sorry, P. sitting in? For PE, right. How about other tests though? If you have a dissection case. TEE. Oh, TEE. Do you have access to that 24 seven? No, not 24 Yeah, okay. So, but that's actually, of all the studies out there, there are two that are considered even better than CT angio. One is MR. MR is 100% sensitive, 100% specific. However, who has 24-7 MR? Most of us don't. Um, the other is TEE in the hands of a good cardiologist, a good echocardiographer is also extraordinarily good. You had a hand in the back? Well, I read a fascinating article last year from Japan about using D-dimer. Mm. Basically, you're going to be throwing the supply to the It's coming. 
It's coming. It's actually, there's actually three now articles out there. We'll talk about that as well because there's a, still a little bit of a question mark about D-dimers. But as far as imaging studies, CT angio is what most of us use. It's available for most of us 24-7. Most of our radiologists know how to read them. It's useful. And overall, the thing that's kind of nice about CT angio is that it's a decent study. Sensitivity is about 85 to 90 percent. It's not perfect. Um, but it also will pick up other things. There's two papers in there that look at Gee, it's not a dissection, but one of them actually was a paper that looked at getting CT angios for PE, and oh wow, we found seven of those patients actually had dissections instead. Oops, wasn't what we expected, but wow, cool, yay, <laughs> picked it up, excellent. Thank you. Okay, good, no lawsuit on that one. So overall, just know CT angio is probably the most reliable test, but I'll tell you, there's one paper that's not in here that came out about two years ago that says if you are absolutely sure it's aortic dissection. It walks it, it talks it, it smells it, it has all the findings, it's perfect. And you have a negative CT angio, you need another study. That's, that's, and that's an issue. That's actually come, a couple papers actually have inferred it. There's one paper that actually looked at that. To, because it's not a 100% sensitive test. And if your pre-test test likelihood is, it is a dissection. There is nothing else that would cause neural findings and a pulse deficit in both arms and ripping pain. There's nothing else that'll do this. And my CT's negative, you gotta do something else. You can't just say, oh, well, don't know why you're hemiplegic. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is, but so that's just, that's kind of an aside. Now the D-dimer issue that you mentioned starts at abstracts 13 and 14, and there's actually another paper that's not in here that looks at it as well. The theory is, you shred your intima, or your uh, media of your aorta, Psh, it's ripping. Your body's reaction to that is gonna be wanna go stop it and make some clot and you're gonna increase your D-dimer because you're making and breaking down this clot of this area that's shearing down your aorta. How good is that? Does that really happen? Do you get an elevated D-dimer in somebody who has an aortic dissection? Papers 13, 14, and then this best evidence topics report that came out in March of 2005, which may be what you read, all say yes. The D-dimer is elevated in patients who have aortic dissection. The problem is, there were only 100 patients total that have, this has been reported on to date. The other problem is they didn't look at it in sort of this unselected walk into the ER, it's in my differential group of people. What it would be nice to know, and what we need is a big study to look at this, is does a negative D-dimer, a low D-dimer, completely exclude the diagnosis? That's what we need. I want, it, I want someone to tell me, we studied X number of patients, made sure the study was good enough, powerful enough, and we found that if the D-dimer is low, it is never an aortic dissection, period, you're done. We don't know that. And the problem is it's sort of like PE. You know that a negative D-dimer in somebody who is an absolute slam dunk could be nothing else but a PE is useless and in fact gets you in trouble. It may be the same case in an aortic dissection. And I think what's gonna have to happen is a pyoped equivalent for aortic dissection. My clinical suspicion is low, the D-dimer is negative, I'm done. My clinical suspicion is metza metza, D-dimer is negative, is what do I do there? And if I really think it's a dissection, and I have a negative D-dimer, is it good enough? We don't know, we don't know. So right now, I personally think the jury's out on what to do with the D-dimer level in somebody who's a suspected dissection. I get to be careful knowing the pitfalls of the test. If it's up, I'm still worried about it, and PE is still in differential and all those other weird things too. So D-dimer is one of those kind of tough tests that I would just love if someone would do the study to say, low, you know, your clinical suspicion is X, you're done. The pyoped equivalent sort of basically of that. Any questions so far? Because we're kind of speeding along here. Yeah. There is a specific protocol. Yeah. No, and, that, well, and what you have to do, and this is where it's a bit of, well, I'll tell you, there's a little bit of good news. There, it's a different protocol for PE than it is to look at, there's three different chest protocols. One is a dissection protocol, one is a lung protocol, and one is a, I don't know, let's see what's in there, <laughs> just check it out and give some dye and see what's what. So there's three different protocols, and they're basically timing protocols and how the pictures are taken and in what part of the respiratory cycle they're taken. So it's, that's, the, that's the issue. The, the, the bad news is they have higher yields if the right kind of protocol is done. The good news is you still pick up these a significant amount of the time, even if it's not the right protocol. You know, I was getting a chest CT because I saw a little nodule over there, and oh, 
whoops, there's a dissection. I mean, they pay, so, so the bad news is it's not perfect if you don't order the exact right thing. You know, I don't know, it could be a PE, it could be a dissection, I don't know. Do it, tell me what you see. If they, are, if they did the wrong protocol, you're still okay. The only thing that's a problem is if you're just getting that, I don't know, we're just, it's a patient with a lung mass, we need a contrast CT, that isn't a good protocol for lung or for aorta because it's basically the dye is given, it's done in a much more leisurely fashion rather than these really rapid CTs that are taken for both lung and aorta. Okay, does that make sense? Well, it depends. If I'm, if I, because it's not infrequent that you're standing at the bedside going, could be a PE, could be a dissection. It's not common that you're saying, I don't know, it could be a mass or pneumonia. That's, that's later. You know, you look at the x-ray, it's like, oh, hmm, that's kind of weird. But, but it's that kind of sharp kind of pain, a little bit pleuritic, it kind of maybe moves. I'm worried about PE, and, and both of those will have positive D-dimers if, if they have the, you know, abnormality, so. Okay. Uh, the other issue that comes up with aortic dissection that's an issue is we know that when people dissect their proximal aorta, it can come all the way back to the root, and it can interrupt the aortic um, valve, which is why we listen for aortic regurge acutely. Theoretically, it can also go down and hit the coronary ostia and cause occlusion of a coronary artery, sort of like birdshot if you get shot by the vice president, you can occlude a coronary artery with birdshot. Did you guys hear that? Unbelievable. What are the odds of that? Unbelievable. Anyway, you could, you could occlude a coronary ostia with this flap and have a transmural MI, a STEMI. Does that actually happen? Because you all know, if you go to the bedside, they're having chest pain, you get the 12 lead EKG, ooh, there's ST elevation, I'm in my window, yay, boom, get the thrombolytics out, yahoo, yay, you know, another check mark. Oops, what if it's that dissection that's occluded the coronary artery causing that STEMI? Do you have to worry about that? Abstract number 15 is one paper of several that looks at this. It's, it's a 50 patient study with documented dissections. All of these patients had documented dissections and not one of them had thrombolytic criteria on their 12 lead EKG, not one. There are several other papers out there that look at this and of course one of the papers has two patients in the paper that did have STEMIs caused by dissection. The reality is the odds are extraordinarily small that aortic dissection will cause a STEMI that would lead to thrombolytics. Really quite to the point where if it sounds like it's, it's angina, if it sounds like you know, true ischemic chest pain, your 12 lead shows ST elevation, go for it, okay? If you're not, if you're not a PCI icon kind of hospital, if you're a thrombolytic place, go for it. The one kind of question mark is, it's sharp chest pain, kind of goes through to the back. There's a STEMI on the 12 lead. What do I do then? Then it's probably worth a film in the interim, but don't delay a whole lot to do it. The odds are so small that a true STEMI is caused by a dissection that you're probably safe to go ahead and give the drugs. Now, yeah. I had one patient, 40 year old, acute anterior wall MI. She was on, he started on heparin, went to the she, oh, she started on heparin, yeah, it was a dissection. Yeah, it occurs, it absolutely occurs. Interestingly, the STEMIs that occur, you actually had a weirder, 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 you had one of those, he had a, an anterior wall in my case that was a young person who went to the OR just on heparin, not thrombolyzed, went to or the cath lab and had a dissection as the cause. The, um, if they have STEMIs, the most common STEMI they have, and again, we're getting out there to weird, like Vegas kind of odds. You know, getting out, it's usually a, a right, it's a right-sided MI. It's usually the right coronary ostia that gets hit first when they dissect back, they get the right coronary ostia. So she was actually weird, weird and weird. It wasn't even her left main, it was her left anterior wall. I mean, it was, it sounds like she had, an, she, you got, Nothing. you needed to be betting in Vegas that day because you would have hit big because that was a really odd case. That's very unusual to see. Now the following papers, of course, to, if we predicate the whole next papers with, it's rare. If you do it, it's really bad. If you give thrombolytics to a dissection case, it's just really bad. <laughs> There's two papers that look at, I like the title of 16, Inadvertent Thrombolytic administ Administration to Patients Without Myocardial Infarction. <laughs> Oops, sorry. You didn't really have an MI, we're kidding. Well, it's okay to be kidding as long as something bad doesn't happen. The problem is that in dissection cases, they die. And in pericarditis cases, they tamponade and can die. 
So those are the two sort of, and they're tough. Think about it. It's, it's a pain from here to here. You know, it's sharp pain, and I don't know. These are tough. These are hard. Just know that if you do do it inadvertently, things are not good. Things don't go particularly well. Good. Uh, fortunately, though, it's uncommon that you actually have a true STEMI. So, yeah. Yes and no. Um, it turns out that if you compare, in, and, and now what we're doing is we're subsetting out a, the ascending dissection from the descending. It's very hard to see a, D, a type B dissection on a transthoracic. It's easy to see out a trans, a trans esophageal because you're right there. You're looking through the esophagus at the, at the you know, descending aorta. The anterior, so we're, so we're kind of already now limiting ourselves to anterior, but those are the ones that do cause the um, osteo problems. If you compare TEE to TTE's sensitivity in the ability to pick up dissection, you have about a 20% sensitivity drop going from TEE to TTE. If they see it, it's there, usually. If they don't, you still have a risk of it being there because transthoracic is not as good as, it's sort of like a, I think of it as um, likened to a transvaginal ultrasound for a pregnancy versus a transabdominal ultrasound. Sometimes transabdominal, it's like, what's in there? Transvaginal, it's like waving at you. It's the same concept to be closer to the vessel itself. So transthoracic, you still will miss a significant proportion of even the um, anterior, or the ascending aorta dissections. So, but if, but if it's quick, it's easy, they can do it and they see it, yay. It's just that they don't. Yeah. Not related, though, how about the inadvertent administration of heparin in the situation? Mm. The risk of heparin, of giving heparin to an aortic dissection, is not, it's still pretty terrible. It's not as bad as thrombolytics, because thrombolytics, you're, you're completely hosed and it's non reversible. Versus heparin, if you're giving unfractionated heparin, it's theoretically reversible. Yes, you significantly increase your risk of death in giving heparin to those patients as well. So it's, uh, that's, that's why if you have dissection in your differential, or non STEMI in your differential, make sure if you have any question to go ahead and image the aorta before you give it anything that would cause them to bleed, have increased bleeding risk. All right, last little bit. The current treatment of aortic dissection, there is nothing fancy or new. It's the same old, same old. Control the heart rate and control the blood pressure. How you do it is up to you. By the way, one of the things that, that I notice, particularly in residents, is they'll come away from a bedside and they'll say, gosh, you know, I'm worried about aortic dissection. I mean, I'm not 100% sure it's there, but I'm worried. It's like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Well, you know, we'll get the study. They're, you know, in the line for the CT scanner. They're the 12 in the queue to get into the scanner. I said, what do you do in the meantime? Nothing. There's no downside, as long as you know the risks and benefits of all the meds, there is no downside to starting a beta blocker and nipride or labetalol if you're a labetalol fan, which is fine, and then stopping it. If it turns out not to be the diagnosis, there's a whole lot of downside to not treating up front when you're worried about it and then having them progress during the time it takes to get their confirmatory study. So the sort of the, if you come away from the bedside thinking, wow, <laughs> I'm worried about dissection on this person, get the meds started. Get your tests ordered, get whatever you're going to do, TEE, TTE, whatever, CT scan, MR, whatever. Get the test ordered, but get them on the drugs first. The papers here look at labetalol. How many of you use labetalol? A lot of people do. It's easy. You know, bolus, it's a very easy to give. It's very easy. The, do know, though, that labetalol is a much better beta blocker than alpha blocker. So you may get really good beta block, you know, heart rate control. You may not get the blood pressure control that you want, which is okay. Then you may need to add something. Just know that you may, it's, a, it's a nice single drug to pull. You just may not get the blood pressure that you want out of it, which is fine. Then you just add something to it if you need it. The other two papers, by the way, in here look at esmolol, which is the, sort of the short-acting. Nice thing about esmolol, especially if you use esmolol and um, nipride as a combo, is you have two drugs that have a less than 10-minute half-life. And if for some reason you got in trouble, somebody you know, dropped their blood pressure, really bothered about their heart rate, you can turn each of those off and have them back to what should be their baseline within 10 minutes. So that's the nice thing about those. Labetalol doesn't do that. So any questions on this? I wish I had like fabulous take-home answers for you, but there aren't a lot. 